Thank you so much. You know, we're all excited for, for the main event, and there are a couple, a couple of preliminaries. I did want to welcome you, uh, students, faculty, friends, distinguished guests, and of course our esteemed speaker for tonight. Um, welcome those who are here, welcome those who are uh, joining us online. I'm Ed Schatz, I'm the director of the Monk School's Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies, uh, which in a few weeks' time will be called the Center for European and Eurasian Studies. No matter, no matter what we call ourselves, here at the University of Toronto, our center is blessed with terrific students, world-class faculty, and excellent administrative support. As a result, our center is, I think it's fair to say, among North America's most prominent, most active, and most creative centers for research and teaching about the region. Let me give you a couple of, of highlights. Uh, since the full-scale war uh, began, our center uh, and the Monk School more broadly have held countless events uh, numbering, I think, Lucan, over 100 at this point, both in person and online about the war in its various dimensions and, of course, with attention to its consequences. Thanks to the efforts of Monk Director Peter Lowen, who I think is here somewhere, Peter over there, um, and our own Lucan Way, we now have a dual degree program with the Kiev School of Economics. Our Petro Yatsik program for the study of Ukraine has developed an innovative non-residential scholars uh, program that supports those research scholars who are in Ukraine and cannot leave uh, the country. And they meet, they meet online, it's been tremendously successful. And finally, we've mounted a project funded by Shirk to work with our dear colleagues from Kiev Mohila Academy on what we're calling real-time scholarship during war. And these are just some of the things that, that, that we do. Of course, there's always much more to be done, especially, as we know, in times like ours. Uh, but we look forward to new initiatives going forward. Allow me to offer uh, the University of Toronto's land acknowledgement. Um, it's something we do regularly, but I think it links to some of the themes um, from today's event. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. <laughs> Insert humorous music. I think that was Lucan's joke. OK. Um, today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous people uh, from across Turtle Island, and we are indeed grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. What has happened to Ukraine, at least since 2014, of course, that, uh, with, uh, with a much longer uh, prehistory to that, forces us to confront quite difficult questions about sovereignty, about land, about justice and injustice, about human rights, and the gross and systematic violation of those human rights. And there are few people as prepared to discuss such issues as Alexandra Matvichuk. On behalf of our center and our partners at the Canada-Ukraine Foundation, we are indeed honored that you are able to join us uh, today, and we very much look forward to today's discussion. Of course, it's a discussion that we wish we didn't have to have, uh, but we must. Before I invite Luke and Wei to the podium to introduce uh, Ms. Matvichuk, let me also acknowledge the terrific people behind the scenes who make such events possible. Thanks to the folks at Innes College, thanks to Olga, Right here, thanks to Tanya somewhere, wherever Tanya is in the back. Thanks to Stacy, and thanks to everyone else who quietly makes magic every day. Luke Way is distinguished professor of democracy in our Department of Political Science. He also co-directs our incredibly active Petroyatsik program for the study of Ukraine. Uh, when I said that our center has world-class faculty, he's precisely what I had in mind. Moreover, Luke is a dear friend. Uh, welcome, Luke Way. Thank you, Ed. Um, and also, I just want to acknowledge Ed's real leadership in uh, changing the name, which met with a little bit of resistance at the university. Um, but you know, you really held with it, and I think uh, for good. So, you know, so it's just an incredible honor um, to host uh, Alexandra uh, Matvichuk. She is one of the most important voices coming out of Ukraine at a moment, um, historical moment of importance. 
Uh, she spent the last two decades fighting for human rights and uh, aiding those suffering under Russian abuses and, and fighting for democracy. In 2013, she founded a Euromaidan SOS right after uh, the forces of Yanukovych uh, assaulted about uh, thir uh, students on November 30th, uh, uh, 2013. And she basically organized a, uh, a number of volunteers to provide legal assistance to those being prosecuted throughout Ukraine uh, during those momentous events 10 years ago. In 2007, uh, she founded, helped found the, the Center for Civil Liberties, which became particularly active after the first invasion in 2014, um, aiding those persecuted in Crimea and Donbass, revealing and revealing the, a whole host of violations against human rights and crimes against humanities. She's also led a number of different campaigns to release political prisoners captured by Russia. She's also won far too many awards <laughs> for me to list all of them. <laughs> I mean, that would take almost the whole evening, but I think you want me to, to get to the main event. But among them is the Right Livelihood Award, the Democracy Defender Award um, you know, uh, given by the OSCE, and most uh, importantly, of course, the, uh, the Center for Civil Liberties was awarded in 2022 the Nobel Peace Prize. But more profoundly, I think, you know, having sort of had the opportunity to look at a number of her speeches, she just has this remarkable ability to convey both the horrors inflicted by the war on Ukraine's most vulnerable at the one end, so it's sort of at the, you know, those at the kind of, so to speak, the bottom, but also to convey the, the global stakes involved in this conflict. And indeed, the global stakes are enormous. So of course, those of us who care about Ukraine care deeply about winning the war, but the war, as she note, has noted a number of times, has far greater importance beyond simply Ukraine. And it's about basically what kind of world do we want to live in? Do we want to live in a world in which any time a country you know, or an autocracy wants a bit of the neighbor next door that they do it? A world in which uh, you know, countries, democracies have to spend an enormous amount on military simply to survive, or do we want a rules-based order? And I think that is something that, you know, th this is really, in a sense, beyond, you know, those suffering in Ukraine, what this war is about. And I think she has, she's been wonderful at articulating that very important point. Okay, so I'm gonna get to the, the main event, but I just wanna give you a, a, a sort of basic outline. First, um, after inviting you to the stage, we're going to have two short films about her work. Uh, then uh, I'm going to open it up to questions. So there, where is the, the there's a person with cards right here and there. So think of questions, especially if you're students, because we're going to do those first. So um, I strongly encourage you during the movie, when you think of it, just think of questions and then uh, when, uh, when Ms. Matvichuk is over, we will open it up. So without further ado, thank you. My name is Alexandra Matvichuk. I am a human rights lawyer, part of the Center for Civil Liberties. When we speak about illegal deportation of Ukrainian children, we speak at least about several categories. The first categories are children who were deported together with their parents. And their destiny depends whether or not their parents found resources and energy to leave Russia as quickly as possible. The second categories is children from the state institutions like orphanage and we have no tool to track their destiny. The third categories is children who were sent by their parents to summer camps in Russia during the battles on their territories and when these territories were released Russians refused to return their children back. 
And fourth category, the children whose parents were killed by Russians were arrested and kept in infiltration camps by Russians. And even these children are preparing for a forcible adoption in Russian families, regarding that fact that they have families and relatives in Ukraine. We are in the cause of the war, and that is why we don't know numbers. Ukrainian officials identified almost 20,000 Ukrainian children being illegally deported to Russia, and only 388 of these children were able to return back. But Russian sites said about more than 700,000 of Ukrainian children crossing the Russian borders. And we have no instruments either to prove or deny these figures. International Criminal Court last year issued arrest warrants against Russian President Vladimir Putin and his child commissioner Maria Lvova Belova for the forcible deportation of Ukrainian children. International Criminal Court qualified these actions as a war crimes. But this is much bigger than war crimes. It's a part of genocidal policy of Russian state. Putin and Russian top officials openly say that there is no Ukrainian nation, there is no Ukrainian language, there is no Ukrainian culture. And that is why Russian state take Ukrainian children to Russia to raise them up as Russians. And that is why, when they cross Russian borders, these children are put in re-education camps where they tell that they are not Ukrainian children but Russian children, and then are preparing for forcible adoption in Russian family to bring them up as Russians. Let me share the story of 10-year-old Ilya from Mariupol. When the Russians circled the city, they didn't grant permission for the International Committee of Red Cross to evacuate civilians. As a result, Ilya and his mother, like thousands of others in Mariupol, sought refuge in the basement of their residential buildings. They melted snow for water and made fires to cook what little food they had. However, when their supplies ran out, they were needed to leave the basement. Suddenly, they found themselves in the center of Russian attacks. Ilya's mother was struck in the head, and the boy was seriously injured. Despite the dangers, his mother bravely carried him to a friend's apartment. At that moment, there was no medical care assistance available, because the Russians had intentionally destroyed the maternity hospital in Mariupol along with entire medical infrastructure. So they simply lay on a couch, hugging to each other. Ilya later told my colleague that his mother died and froze in his arms. However, that's not the end of the story. When Russians occupied the city, they forcibly transferred Ilya to Russia. His family made enormous effort to bring him back home. This topic is highly sensitive for Ukrainian society because the illegal deportation of Ukrainian children vividly illustrates that we are not just fighting for the freedom to be an independent state but not Russian colony, that we are not just fighting for a freedom to make our own democratic choice, but also about the freedom to preserve our Ukrainian identity and not to be compelled to re-educate our children as Russians. So, I hope for a fruitful discussion today. We truly need your assistance to find comprehensive answers to the complex questions of how to return the thousands and thousands of illegally deported Ukrainian children to their homes.
никто не объяснял мне папа. Нам говорили, один дядя вообще сказал то, то, что он вернется через 7 лет. Они сначала спросили у меня, а, у тебя, давай мы вас отправим а, троих в одну а, семью ненадолго, ну, на время, пока папа сможет вас, нас забрать или мы вас можем отвезти. Или а, в приют. Я сказал, я не дам ответа, пока с папой не свяжусь. Ту картину, яку побачила я, коли заглянула туди, де це спортзал, де сама більша кімната. Ну це справжнє пекло. Пекло в тому вигляді, в якому малюють на старовинних іконах. Не били по голові, це по ногах, по тулубу. Було всього декілька ударів. Чим такі удари, якісь зековські, коли бліть ладошками, зразу по двох ушах дуже сильно вдарі. Таке... Відчуття, що як контузія в тебе. Все, не все, все, мать. Мене чи як-то чагом ушила на час, я не знаю, я не поняла. Потім встаю така і смотрю ногу, а тут у мене вся в крові. От. Ось що зараз в моїй ногу. Темно-темно, таке все чорне, і ноутбуки горять. А вони всі розкинені, а ось ця, ця заставка, вона, типу, вона циклічно крутиться, вона не виключається. Типу. І я вже розвертаюся, ось сидить Андрюша Красюк, продавець. І він тяне руку, типу, Славка, помоги. Кажу, Андрюшин, давай, давай, ну, під час йдемо, йдемо, сонечко, виходимо, давай, потихеньку цей. А він кричить, я не можу. Він знову падає. Дружу забрали, і він в лікарні помер. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to address to this distinguished audience. I am a human rights lawyer, and I have been applying the law to defend people and human dignity for many years. But now, as you have just seen in this video, I and others Ukrainian human rights colleagues are in a situation when the law doesn't work. Russian troops deliberately shelling residential buildings, schools, churches, museums, and hospitals. They are attacking evacuation corridors. They are torturing people in infiltration camps. They are forcibly taking Ukrainian children to Russia. They ban Ukrainian language and culture. They are abducting, robbing, raping, and killing civilians in the occupied territories. And the entire UN system of peace and security can't stop this. When large-scale war started, we united efforts with dozens of organizations from different regions. We built national network of local documentators. We covered the whole country including the occupied territories. We have an ambitious goal to document each criminal episode which was committed in the smallest village in each oblast in Ukraine. And working together only for the two years of large-scale war, we jointly documented more than 72,000 episodes of war crimes. And 72,000, it's a huge amount, but just tip of iceberg, because Russia uses war crimes like a method of warfare. Russia attempts to break people resistance and occupy the country by the tool which I call the immense pain on civilian population. So we document something much more 
than just violations of Geneva and Hague conventions. We document human pain. Let me illustrate it. This is a story of 14 year old Sofia from Mariupol. When Russian troops tried to siege her city, Sofia, her mother, and her younger brother and sister hide in the basement of their building from the Russian shelling. Once the family was bombed by a Russian aircraft. Her brother died immediately. Her mother died in a few hours when he was took out from the rubbles of the residential buildings. Sophia and her neighbors buried her mother in the garden of their own household. Let me quote Sophia. I went to dig out my mother. I tried to do it with my hands because there were no shovels nearby. Some aircrafts were flying around me. I was also scared at that moment but I wanted to help my mom. I dug her up so she could breathe, and then I went to ask for help. I have a question. How we people who live in 21st century will defend a human beings? Their lives, their freedom, and their human dignity. Can we rely on the law, or does just brutal force matter? The answer to these questions is important not just for people in Ukraine, in Syria, in Myanmar, in Sudan, or in Nicaragua. The answer to these questions will define our common future. I don't know how historians in future will call this period, but we happen to live in very challenging time. The world order, which is based on UN charter and international law, is collapsing before our eyes. This system was established in past century and provided for some countries irrational indulgences. And now it's stolen and reproducing ritualistic movements. The work of Security Council is paralyzed. This means that such fires like wars will appear more and more frequently in different parts of the globe because the international wiring is faulty and sparks are everywhere. I live in Kiev. And my native city is constantly being shelled, not just by Russian rockets, but also Iranian drones. China helped Russia to circumvent sanctions and import technologies critical to warfare. North Korea provided to Russia more than a million artillery shells. Syria votes for Russia in UN General Assembly. All these regimes, which captured power in their own countries, have the same joint feature. They have the same idea what a human being is. They see people like objects of control. They denied people of their rights and freedom. In opposite, democracies developed the space for rights and freedom for people. And there is no way to negotiate it because only existence of free world always provides threats to dictators of losing their power. And that is why, if we don't be able to stop Putin in Ukraine, he will go further. Russia is empire. Empire is a center, has a center, but has no borders. When empire has energy, empire always tries to expand. When you know the world history, it's very difficult to idealize. 
past century brought two devastating world wars, colonial wars, and this all pushed humankind to make decisive lessons learned. And we have Nazi uh, perpetrators who were tried on the Nuremberg trials. The UN system was established. The European Union was created. And this understanding that lives of each person matter transferred into slogan, never again. And the majority of the, war, of the countries in the world commemorate the day of the Second World War with a slog, with a slogan. But evil was punished only in part of the globe. Also, totalitarian gulag was never condemned or punished. And that is why Russia for decades celebrates the end of the Second World War with a slogan, we can repeat. So now they are repeating. Because unpunished evil grows. I personally interviewed hundreds of people who survived Russian captivity. They told me how they were beaten, raped, smashed into wooden boxes, their fingers were cut, their nails were torn away, their nails were drilled. They were compelled to write with their own blood. One woman told me how her eyes was dug out with a spoon. There is no legitimate reason of doing such things. There is also no military necessity. Russians did these horrible things only because they could. Because Russian troops committed horrible crimes in Chechnya, in Moldova, in Georgia, in Mali, in Libya, in Syria, they have never been punished. They believe they can do whatever they want. We must break the circle of impunity. We must demonstrate justice. As a human rights lawyer, I witnessed by myself how quickly this war turned people into the numbers. Because the scale of war crimes grow so large that it become impossible to recognize all the stories. But I will tell you one. This is a story of 62-year-old civilian Alexander Shalipov. He was killed by Russian military near his house. He was civilian. He was unarmed. This tragedy received a huge media coverage only because it was a first court trial after large-scale war started. On the court, his wife, Katerina, shared that her husband was an ordinary farmer. But she told to the judge that he was her whole universe. And now she lost everything. People are not numbers. And that is why we document all these crimes. So that sooner or later, all Russians who committed these crimes by their own hands, as well as Putin and top political leadership and high military command of the Russian state, will be brought to justice. Because we must ensure justice for all victims of this war, regardless who they are, their social position, the types of crime they endured, and whether or not media or international organizations are interested in their case. Because the life of each person matters. And when I went to different advocacy visits to different countries to meet with presidents, with members of governments, with parliamentarians, I witness that they still look to the world through the lens of the Nuremberg trial, when Nazi war criminals were tried only after Nazi regime had collapsed. But we live in a new century. Justice shouldn't be depend on how and when the war will end. We cannot wait. We must establish special tribunal now and hold Putin, 
and his surrounding accountable. If we want to prevent wars in the future, we have to punish the states and the leaders who start such wars in present. It's a common logic. People in Ukraine want peace much more than anyone else. But peace doesn't come when country which was invaded stop fighting. That's not peace. That's occupation. And occupation is horrible. Occupation is just another form of the war. I know what I'm talking about because I have been documenting war crimes for 10 years. I know that people who live in occupation are in gray zone. They have no tools how to defend their rights, their freedoms, their property, their lives, their children, and other beloved members of the family. Russian occupation is not just changing one state flag to another. Russian occupation means torture, rape, enforced disappearances, denial of your identity, forcible adoption of your own children, filtration camps, and mass graves. Let me illustrate it with a story of children writer Volodymyr Vakulenko. When Ukrainian army released Kharkiv region, we found mass graves near forest, in the forest near Izum. The dead bodies of civilians, men, women, and children were there. In the undidentified grave with the number 319, we found that body of Volodymyr Vakulenko. Volodymyr Vakulenko was a children writer. He wrote beautiful stories for children. And entire generations of Ukrainian children brought up on his daddy's book. During Russian occupation, he disappeared. I know his family. His family hoped to the last that Volodymyr is alive. And, but like other thousands, Ukrainian civilians are in Russian captivity. It was very difficult for them to accept the result of the identification. Probably you can ask me, why Russians killed children writer? The answer is simple, because they can. To be clear, Ukrainians in this war fighting not just for territories. First and foremost, we are fighting for people who live there. We have no moral rights to leave these people alone for torture and death. The life of people can't be political compromise. And the political claims to Ukraine to satisfy Russia's imperialist appetites and to bring up part of territories, such claims are not just wrong because Putin will not stop. Such claims are immoral. This war has a genocidal character. Putin openly says there is no Ukrainian nation, there is no Ukrainian language, there is no Ukrainian culture. For 10 years, we document how these words converted in horrible practice on the ground. When Russian troops deliberately exterminate active local people, mayors, priests, children writers, journalists, entrepreneurships, how they deliberately destroy Ukrainian cultural heritage how they forcibly taken Ukrainian children to Russia in order to bring them up as Russians. We have no other choice. If we stop fighting, it will be no more us. This war started not in February 2022, but in February 2014. It was a time when millions of Ukrainians stood up their voice against corrupt and authoritarian pro-Russian government. They peacefully demonstrated just for a chance to build the country where the rights of everybody are protected. Government is accountable, judiciary is independent, and police 
to not be students who are peacefully demonstrating. And we pay in the highest price for this chance. That time, I was a coordinator of civil initiative Yavro Maidan SOS. We brought up thousands of people to provide legal assistance to persecuted protesters. And every day, hundreds and hundreds of people who were beaten, arrested, tortured, accused and fabricated criminal or administrative charges pass through our care. And when we succeed, an authoritarian regime collapsed, and we got this chance for democratic transition, in order to stop us on this way, Russia invaded. Russia occupied Crimea, part of Luhansk and Donetsk regions, and two years ago, extended this war to the large-scale invasion. Because Putin is not afraid of NATO, Putin is afraid of the idea of freedom which came closer to Russian borders. And that is why this is not just a war between two states. This is a war between two systems, authoritarianism and democracy. And with this war, Russia attempts not just punish people in Ukraine for our democratic choice, which we made 10 years ago. Russia wants to convince the entire world that democracy, freedom, human rights, and rule of law are fake values because they couldn't protect you during the war. Russia attempts to convince that country with a strong military potential at nuclear weapons can break international order, can dictate its rules to entire international community, and even forcibly change internationally recognized borders. And if Russia succeeds, it will encourage other authoritarian leaders in different parts of the globe to do the same. International system of peace and security is not working. This means that democratic countries will be forced to invest the money not in education, healthcare, business, art development, not in solving global problems like climate change or social inequality, but in weapons will witness an emerge of a number of nuclear states, will witness emergence of new weapons of mass destructions and robotic armies. If Russia succeeds and this scenario comes true, we will find ourselves in a world which will be dangerous for everyone without any exceptions. And that is why in this war, Ukrainians are fighting not just for ourselves. We are fighting for the international order and peace which was established after the Second World War. And regardless whether people in Western democracies have bravery to admit it or not, people in Western democracies are safe only because Ukrainians are still fighting. As a human rights lawyer, I know when you can't rely on the legal instruments, you can still rely on people. We get used to look to the world through the lens of states and interstates organizations, but ordinary people have a much greater impact than they can even imagine. Ordinary people can make history. And people in Ukraine is a bright example. I was in Kiev when Russians tried to circle Kiev. I refused to evacuate, but I witnessed how even international humanitarian organizations evacuated their personnel. They leave us alone. Because not just Putin, but also international partners believed that Russia is so enormous opposing power that Ukraine has no potential to resist but ordinary people remained. And ordinary people started to do extra ordinary things. It were ordinary people who helped to survive under artillery's fires. 
It were ordinary people who took people out from the ruined cities. It were ordinary people who broke through the encirclement to provide humanitarian aid. And suddenly, it became obvious that ordinary people fighting for freedom and for human dignity are stronger than even the second army in the world. I would never wish any nation to go through our experience because war is horrible. Probably it's the worst things which can happen in the human life. When large-scale war started, everything which I call normal life was ruined, was crushed in the thousands and thousands of pieces. A possibility just to go to work, to meet with your friends in a cafe, to hug your beloved ones, to have family dinner, everything disappeared. To live during large-scale war means that you live in total uncertainty. You can't plan not just your day, you can't plan your next several hours because you don't know what will happen. To live during large-scale war means that you live in constant fear for your beloved ones because there is no safe place in Ukraine where you can hide from Russian rockets. My friends from Kharkiv told that it takes just 42 seconds for Russian rockets from Belgorod to hit Kharkiv. What you can do having 42 seconds? You can't even hide. But these dramatic times provide us as ordinary people in Ukraine an opportunity to reveal the best in us, to be courageous, to fight for freedom, to make a difficult but right choices, to take burden of responsibility, and to help each other. Because when we help in each other, when we sacrifice in our life for saving others whom we never met before, only in this moment we can acutely aware and acutely feel what does it mean to be human. And I'm here to say that despite everything, the story of Ukraine, it's a life-affirming story. Because dramatic times praise hope. Because when the freedom was denied, it become powerfully break out through the every concrete individuals. Because we still have a chance to fight. Our future is unclear, but we all know that future is not pre-written. And this is a luxury to have right to fight for future, which we want for us and for our children. We all knowing for what we are fighting for. We are fighting for freedom, which have no limitation in national borders. We all know that only spread of freedom make our world safer. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was um, incredibly powerful. And, um, uh, a little bit hard. <laughs> I kind of have to catch my breath. I think a lot of us do. Um, please uh, send up um, questions. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to sort of start. So you mentioned that uh, you've collected uh, 72,000 evidence, evidence of 72,000 war crimes. And of course, um, there's been quite extensive media coverage of Ukraine, I mean, not as much as there once was, but still an enormous amount. But the thing I find quite disheartening, I'll be honest, is that despite all of this, a number of myths persist, both in this community here in Canada, but also especially in the global south. I still get emails saying from very, like, not sort of Russian trolls or you know, people who are very good-hearted saying, well, didn't you know, NATO cause the invasion? 
um, I get sort of people saying, well, how can an anti-American power like Russia be colonial? Only Americans are colonial. <laughs> and of course, we get, you know, in the highest levels of government, as you well know, a persistent idea that if you respond to Russia's aggression, that will be escalatory. These are very frustrating, because you feel like um, I and many others, and especially you, have had enormous numbers of com the same conversations. So my question is, so how do you talk to the convincible people, for example, in the global south, who you know, have very strong negative attitudes towards the West, towards America, towards Israel. Can you sort of offer us some of your insights in terms of how to approach this group of people to counter these myths? Thank you very much for these questions. I know that people notice that the war is going on only when the bombs falls on their heads. But wars have not just military dimension. War has economic, informational, digital, value, and culture, and other dimensions as well. And Russia now waging the war for hearts and minds of people in different countries. Russia very well prepared. Russia invested billions, billions of dollars to informational ecosystem using different methods how to disseminate fake and propaganda. And it's obvious the truth is much more weaker because according scientists lie is, this, is spread in three times quicker in social networks than truth. Especially, so situation is difficult, especially take into account that some countries like countries of Africa or Latin America or Asia are far from Ukraine. And we have a very less horizontal human ties which can help us to deliver on the horizontal level what's going on in Ukraine. And we lack this, um, this uh, ties. Uh, also, I want to comment uh, your mentioning about um, policy, n which I call don't make Putin upset. <laughs> Russia has no red lines, but well-developed democracies always uh, doubt what we can do. They try to draw on these red lines for the, from themselves. Uh, not to make Putin upset, not to escalate. And this is a very wrong approach, which well-developed democracies used for decades, because Russia for decades was proactive. Russia committed something horrible, then presented it like fat accompli, like new normality, and pushed international community to reckon with it. And that's why Russia was always effective, because when you just reactive, when you have no strategy, when you don't take initiative, it means you will play on something rule of game. And you will always fail because you have faced with cheaters, liars, and criminals. So this is a problem that still well-developed democracies are afraid to take initiative and to take decisive action to defend democracy and freedom. And re answering to your question, when I speak with uh, communities, uh, audiences, or my colleagues in countries of Africa, Latin America, Asia, or other countries which are far from Ukraine, I don't try to convince them. I just tell stories which we document. And what my lessons learned from this experience. You can reach to the hearts and minds of people with the stories. And there is three types of bridges which you can build. The first bridge is bridge on values. Communities who have in their past this battle for freedom 
can understand us much more for what we are fighting for, because they experience the same. So they have this value as freedom actualized in their culture, and that is why we are much more understandable. But if it's not a case, you can rely on experience of horror. Two years ago, uh, one year ago, I was in Argentina, and I spoke with uh, some Russian politicians which have economic interests in Russia, and I told them the story of Yevhen Mejavi, which you just see on the video. And suddenly, I, I looked to my counterparts and I witnessed that they're crying. And I was so surprised because it's not something which I expected from pro-Russian politicians to do. But then I told to myself, it's Argentina. It's, they know what does it mean. Because during the military junta, their children also were legally transferred and adopted by other families. So it's this horror which they experienced helped to understand us much more. But the last bridges, even when you can't rely on values or thanks God the country has not such horrible experience, it's still something which you can always rely on. When I tell stories about for example, mother which lost her newborn child because Russian rockets hit maternity hospital intentionally. This story and the pain of this mother understandable for every people, regardless of their citizenship, religion, political views, ideology, color of the skin, ethnicity, etc., etc. Because first and foremost, we are all humans. Thank you. So my next question has to do with, I think a question that has been plaguing a lot of us who watch uh, what is going on in Ukraine. Um, I was just there for a week and you know, experiencing um, in Kiev, which is a lot better than in some other places, but these constant air raid sirens. And I have to tell you, um, after just one week, there were no actual bombs when I was there. After just one week of, of air raid sirens, I was incredibly stressed out. Um, and I can only imagine how it must be for you and for all of you people who live in Ukraine you know, to survive this. So I guess um, my first question is, how do you maintain your mental health and physical stability? You know, so what are you, can you just talk, talk about um, how Ukrainians sort of maintain um, their mental health in, in this kind of almost impossible context? Let me answer into this question with uh, one personal story. In December 2022, I found myself in a flat without heating, light, electricity, water, internet connection, and then even the mobile connection was disappeared. And my husband brought to kitchen several bricks. And I looked to him and asked, honey, what are you doing? Why you brought two bricks to the kitchen? And he told, you see, we have, luckily, we have this gas oven. And I will experiment. When we put bricks on this gas oven, how long they can keep warm? And I told to myself, oh my God, I returned to the Middle Ages. <laughs> now we will have to warm up bricks in the kitchen and survive like using the worms. Uh, so it's one expression, which is uh, one example, which is not uh, visible, how you experience the war, like being ordinary people in a city under Russian attack, but it's also showed that it's a real difficulties. And a lot of people are suffering. Frankly speaking, I myself wasn't prepared. I told you that I have a 
as a um, document for crimes since the war started in February 2014, we was the first human rights organization who sent mobile groups to Crimea, to Luhansk and Donetsk regions. We was the first who made the list of political prisoners in the Russia. We was the first who started international campaigns to relieve them. So I know a lot about torture, sexual violence, ill treatment, and extrajudicial killings in the illegal place of detentions. But when large scale war started, I faced with such enormous amount of pain that I understood that even me, with all my experience, with all my knowledge, with all my previous years of work, wasn't prepared for this horror. And that is why it's not an easy question to answer. But what helped me personally to keep going? It's two things. First, I believe that our efforts matter. I know this from Ukrainian history because uh, I was brought up by Ukrainian dissidents. And dissidents' movements, it was a movement of intellectuals uh, who bravely used their words and their own position against uh, the whole Soviet totalitarian machine. And when you look to this um, dissident movements from the short-term perspective, you can say that they are failures because the dissident movements was crushed. Part of people were jailed, part of people were killed, part of people uh, were put uh, for forcible psychological treatment. Um, all families were separated, all careers were ruined. But when you look to the, from the long-term perspective, and we can, have, we can look from the long-term perspective to this uh, historical uh, event, we all know that we managed to restore our independence in the 19th only because it were bravely people, brave people, who struggled against the whole Soviet totalitarian machine. So this understanding that all efforts matters helped me personally to keep going. And second, probably I will mention responsibility. I remember one person who told me his story. He found me um, by himself. Uh, he was illegally detained in Donetsk. He was um, uh, tortured. Uh, he subjected to sexual violence. And we have the typical questionnaire. And I asked him, because it was question in this questionnaire, uh, did he apply uh, to the legal enforcement bodies in Ukraine? And he said no. And I asked uh, why. And he answered, but what they can do? <laughs> they can't arrest my perpetrators in the occupied territories in Russia, so I don't want to waste my time. And I asked him, but you came to myself. <laughs> why you came to me? <laughs> and he make a pause, and then he start to speak a long monologue. And I understand from this monologue that he still have a hope. He still have a hope that justice is possible, even though delaying in time. And if he still have a tiny hope, he want his story to be written by someone. So I fear. I feel the huge responsibility for thousands and thousands of stories which we um, and with our partners were documented. Thank you. Um, first of all, I, you've been sitting, standing for quite a long time. Um, you are very welcome. It's up to you to sit in this chair. But, um, Probably I will change your position just for dynamic. OK. <laughs> But do we have, I think you need another microphone. I have oh, you have a microphone. OK, good. OK, so um, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask a somewhat personal question, not too personal, don't worry, uh, which is sort of, can you just talk about how you got involved in um, human rights law? Sort of, was this something that you knew from the very beginning that you were going to do, or was this kind of response to events, the many sort of revolutionary events that occurred in Ukraine? 
When I was in school, I got acquaintance with uh, Ukrainian dissidents. And one of them, a very famous uh, Ukrainian philosopher, writer, and former political prisoner of Soviet Gulag, Yevhen Sverstyuk, started to take care about me. Probably today we will name this relationship mentor, <laughs> mentoring. Um, so suddenly, being a child, I appeared in a circle from the people from historical books. Fantastic people who tell what they think and do what they tell. Who has no other instruments, just their own words and their own position, and they bravely used their own words and their own position against the whole totalitarian machine. As I mentioned previously, they were repressed severely, but they didn't stop. And it was so a huge inspiration for me that I decided to study law and to continue this fight for freedom and for human dignity. Thank you. Um, so my next question relates to, you mentioned your, the project on the tribunal. And of course, we also have um, the uh, International Criminal Court of Justice, which um, has a warrant out for the arrest of um, Vladimir Putin. Um, can you talk about sort of ways to sort of, uh, how can we sort of make these efforts successful? I mean, so, and, and what are the prospects, do you think, of these various initiatives? The problem is that even well-developed democracies don't understand that peace can't be achieved without justice. That justice is preconditioned to peace in our part of the world, where Russia, for decades, uses the war as a tool how to achieve their geopolitical interests and use war crimes as a tool how to win these wars. And that's why they don't make to create such a tribunal as priority. Also, uh, there is a problem that Russia can create their own tribunal. <laughs> Russia can invite Venezuela, Syria, North Korea, Eritrea, Nicaragua, and um, turn the whole idea of justice into absurd. And this means that we have to create a tribunal in a way that there will be no doubt in its legitimacy. This means that we have to create this tribunal in, f in the frame of international organizations. And United Nations is priority, but because the Security Council is paralyzed, it means that we have to get two-thirds majority of votes in UN General Assembly. And unfortunately, it's not a case for current moment. And that is why we are working on a parallel track we are thinking how to create a special tribunal on the frame of regional international organization, like Council of Europe. But what is also important, I mentioned in my previous speech that uh, sometimes when I meet with politicians, they told me that, let's wait when you win this war. Like, the justice belongs only to, uh, to countries who win. <laughs> I think it's a very wrong approach because we have to send a strong signal that if you start the war, regardless, will you win this war, will you lose this war, if you start the war, you will be punished. Because it's a common logic, but in the whole history of humankind, we have only one such precedent, it was Nuremberg trial. All other tribunals, which you probably heard, like, Yugoslavia, Rwanda tribunals, or special court in Sierra Leone. Uh, it was court, it were courts where perpetrators uh, were persecuted because they kill each other not according to rules, because even wars has rules. But we have to persecute people who start the war, not because they kill each other <laughs> in the war not according to the rules. We have to put the the wars beyond the legal frame. And I think that this is historical task for people who live in the 21st century.
Okay, the next question I'm sure is on the minds of everyone in this room, which is I'm quite gratified to see that there are large numbers of you, um, which is what can people here do to help Ukraine? People here can do a lot, especially taking into account that you live in democracy and you can have influence to political decisions. And I'm not the smartest person in this room, and I can't tell you what you have to do because you know better. And because there are hundreds of methods how to be useful, you can write about what's happened, what is going on in Ukraine, you can collect donations, you can urge your government to provide more support. You can find your way how to be useful. But when sometimes people ask me what we, what we can do, the, the truth is that in reality they ask me about another question. They ask me what we can do to stop this war. This is a real question. Because when you face with such challenges as war, all our efforts may seem modest, because they can't. And that's why this question also say that sometimes we feel learned helplessness. And when I refer to overcoming learned helplessness, I me memorize the banner which was done by artists during the Revolution of Dignity. It was banner with a drop, and it was a title. We are drop, drops in the ocean, which means, yes, we are human beings. We are not gods. Our efforts are modest, but all efforts matter, because together we are ocean. And okay, probably we can't stop this war with our concrete individual efforts, but without our efforts, nothing will be stopped. So, I can't tell you what you have to do. I just ask you to take actions, because we need your help. This is the truth, especially now, when the world lost interest to Ukraine. I always ask myself, if Russians commit this horrible thing in Bucha when the whole world was watching, what the hell is awaiting us if the world lost interest? Thank you. So I'm gonna, this next question is a bit more optimistic, um, which is, I think, you know, as you mentioned, many people underestimated Ukraine, uh, above all, Putin. <laughs> um, but many other people who were much more, um, you know, had better relations with Ukraine. Um, how do you, ex I mean, how do you explain the fact that Ukraine responded so successfully to, um, in the initial weeks of the invasion? I mean, what was the source of Ukrainian strength? Was it the sort of Zelensky, or was it society, or so? Where would you, you know, you know, root this? I think that. Um Authoritarian regime look to the world through the special prisma. They don't believe in power of people. And that is why, because of the long years of repressions in autocrats' um, countries, uh, people are very silent because um, they, in order to survive, they start to think in a way government know better what to do. If our president started this war, probably it's worse to do it. Uh, we just ordinary people, we just live our own life. We can't influence on some big materials, etc., etc. And this is way of thinking uh, for majority of people in autocratic countries, which means that these countries can have a lot of population, but very small amount of citizens, because the way of thinking of citizens is different. Citizens is not just connection with your country through the passport. Citizens means that you feel responsibility for your country. 
and for everything which is going on. And because we are nation in transit, we are not ideal, but democracy. We have enormous amount of citizens who take responsibility for the country from the first days of large-scale war. And this is something which wasn't understandable for Putin because, once again, he doesn't believe in the power of people. So, um, one of the things that's, I've lived in Russia and I've been in Ukraine for a long time, one of the things that struck, stri has always struck me about Russians, Russian members of government, members of the Russian public, is that at one level you would think because they live so close to Ukraine, many of them have relatives in Ukraine, um, that they would understand Ukraine. <laughs> but yet, I am struck by the utter, there's no better word for it, stupidity of you know, Russian opinions about Ukraine and their total lack of understanding. So how, would you, how can you explain the fact that a group of people that are so close <laughs> and should know so much better about Ukraine nonetheless seem to not understand at all what the Ukrainian nation is? Let me start with a very old joke. We have this joke in Ukraine, even before the war started. When you met Russian abroad, oh, sorry, it started not like this. When you met foreigner abroad, this foreigner being people from France or from Italy or from Canada, or from other countries of the world, asking you what's going on in Ukraine. But when you meet Russian abroad, they started to tell you <laughs> what's going on in Ukraine. <laughs> this is a very old joke. <laughs> and I think that uh, it's part of truth in this joke. But we are different nations. When you look to each social survey about values of Ukrainian people, you will always see that Ukrainians put freedom in first place of hierarchical values. And this is not the same with Russians. We have even different value mental map in our minds and hearts. And that is why, because we different set of values, we see the world different. So it's the first uh, reason. But there are also second reason. The problem is that Russia is imperialist nation. which means that this is not just war of one people. Unfortunately, majority of Russians support this war or take the stand uh, not to interfere because government know better. And this is because they have a long lasting tradition of impunity. They have no chance to reflect about their own history. That it's not okay to invade another country, to kill people there, to erode their identity. Let me refer to my friends, Russian human rights colleagues. They told when Soviet Union collapsed in the 19th, it was the huge dispute in Russia whether or not it was to, to organize this real historical uh, legal process about crimes against humanity which was conducted in Soviet Union. And even human rights defenders, part of them at least, told that there is no necessity. Let's concentrate on the future. Let's do reforms. Let's go further. Everybody is un uh, everyone understands that it's, it's bad things to do. <laughs> but now Russian repeated. Because if we will not deconstruct impunity which Russia enjoyed for decades will always deal with this imperialist culture which provides a threat not just for Ukraine but for other countries. So I guess my other related question is um, we oftentimes hear the, the term good Russians mostly meant ironically in Ukraine. Um, I mean do you work with, or can you work with Russian civil society? Is there a sort of a, a good Russia? <laughs> Probably you know that we shared the Nobel Peace Prize with our, with our friends and colleagues 
um, Russian um, human rights defenders from Memorial. And I will be very honest, we closely work with Russian human rights defenders before the war started in 2014. We aren't intensify our efforts when the war started in 2014, and now we work on daily basis when the large-scale war started, because we have thousands, thousands, and thousands illegally detained people in Russia. And for us, the only way to even to try to understand where they are, to use these old connections to deliver them some parcels, or to send independent lawyer who can't change the verdict, but at least provide information what's going on with the people. It's possible only because we have brave Russian colleagues who helped us with this. The, and just two months ago, my friend and colleague, a 71-year-old uh, human rights defender, Oleg Karlov, the head of Human Rights Center Memorial, was jailed. He was jailed on fabricated case because he wrote article which has titled that how Russians want fascism and get it. And when he heard the verdict in the court hearing, he told publicly, it's one more argument that I was right and accurate in my article. The problem is that my brave Russian colleagues are tiny minority in Russia. Majority of Russians supported this war. Putin governed the country and not just with repressions and censorship, but with a special social contract between Kremlin's elite and Russian people. And the social contract is based on Russian glory. And the problem is that, unfortunately, majority of Russians still see their glory in forcible restoration of Russian empire. And that is why, when I ask my Russian human rights colleagues how we can help you, because Russian human rights organizations were banned. Part of my colleagues were forced to leave the country. Part of them were jailed. Part of them hardly working under the constant threat. So when I asked them what we can help for you, they always responded, if you want to help us, please be successful. Because only success of Ukraine and military defeat of Russia will provide a chance for Russian people to reflect about the imperialist culture and find another ground for Russian glory. There is no guarantee, but guarantees not exist in our life. There is a chance, and now they have a zero chance. So it's a luxury to have such chance. Thank you. And I guess a related question, which is, we've all, you know, um, the last six months have been somewhat disheartening for many people. We thought the counteroffensive would, would be more successful. But where is you see Ukraine winning in the war in terms of drones or social media or, or so? Where are your areas of optimism in terms of the military effort? I'm not a military expert, but I'm citizen of my country, which is fighting against Russian aggression and suddenly understood, um, not now, but uh, some times ago, that we, if we want to get right answer, uh, we have to ask right question. It's not just problem of Ukraine. <laughs> we have to ask what we, civilized world, have to do to stop Russia. What our common strategy? Because if we always hear that, you, we know you're fighting not just ourselves, you're fighting for Europe. Where our common strategy how to win this fight? When large-scale war started, civilized world told, let's help Ukraine not to fail. And Ukraine obtained a first weapons to be able to defend ourselves. And first real sanctions against Russia were introduced into force. And we are extremely grateful because it's helped us to survive. But it's also an explanation why Ukraine was waiting for a first modern tank for more than a year. Why we still waiting for a 
more than plates. Why we had to start counteroffensive last year without zero possibility to secure Ukrainian sky? Because there is a huge differences between two narratives. Let's help Ukraine not to fail, and let's help Ukraine to win. <laughs> and we can practically measure these differences in types of weapons, in speed of decisions, in gravity of sanctions. We have to set a common goal how to help Ukraine win. And this is not just a question for Ukraine. <laughs> it's a question for all of us. Because if we not be able to stop Putin in Ukraine, he will go further. People who released from Russian captivity told us that Russians said, first we will release Ukraine, and then, together with you, we will go to conquer in other countries. And the process of forcible mobilization is going for these all years in occupied territories. And when you look what the Russian army is, you will see there a lot of not ethnic Russians, people from Buryatia, Tatarstan, Yakutia, Ingushetia, Dagestan. This is a policy of empire. To use uh, empire which see human life like the cheapest resources and see indigenous people like a fuel for imperialistic goals. Thank you. I think that wraps it up. Thank you. Um, but thank you so much. Um, that was incredibly moving and, and educational. But there is more. <laughs> it's a little surprise um, that we have the pleasure uh, to introduce my old friend, Krista Freeland, who. She uh, is, as you know, the Deputy Prime Minister of, of Canada. She is the Finance Minister. She uh, also is the Member of Parliament from the Rosedale Riding, very close by. She began her career as a freelance journalist in Ukraine, back when things were really changing, <laughs> to put it mildly. Um, and she ha then uh, had a brilliant career in journalism in the Financial Times, the Gl Global Mail. Um, and throughout all of this, uh, I would say, knowing her quite well, she has been an ardent advocate both for Ukraine, but more broadly uh, for the establishment and strengthening of an international rules-based order. So without further ado, Christia, go for it. Okay. Um, well, good evening. Dobre večer. Uh, ça m'a fait un tellement grand pl plaisir d'être ici ce soir. Merci beaucoup, Peter, Luke, and Edward pour l'invitation. Um, I'm so sorry to have arrived late. Um, I think and I hope Alexandra will forgive me when I explain the reason. Um, I agree with Alexandra that a country, a society, is only as strong as its people and its democracy. Uh, and democracy is, of course, a noun, but we have to make it a verb. And as you may know, there's a by-election coming up just north of my riding. So I was out canvassing um, for a little bit this evening before coming here. Um, but I did um, really want to come here. Um, and first of all, to say to Alexandra, um, on my behalf, um, we are, Lucan actually in my riding of University Rosedale, so as the local MP, but also as Canada's finance minister and deputy prime minister, thank you so much. Duje, duje, shtero vam dyakuyu. Um, Alexandra said, I caught a few of her remarks at the end, and she said a minute ago um, that she is grateful that Ukraine is grateful for our support. And that is very nice of you to say, but actually we should be so grateful to Alexandra, to all Ukrainians, because truly 
you are fighting the world's fight. Uh, we recognize that. Uh, and I think we need to do more and more to support you. So I really just want to start by saying, and I see heads nodding, um, on behalf of Canada and Canadians, There was a really beautiful example uh, just yesterday of the recognition of so many of the people of the world's democracies of what I've just said. Um, I'm sure we have all seen that amazing video of President Zelensky at the D-Day commemorations. Um, our Prime Minister, Prime Minister Trudeau, introduced President Zelensky to an American veteran who was there. Um, and I wrote down the exchange. Um, the American veteran said to President Zelensky, you are the savior of the people. And President Zelensky said, no, 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 you saved Europe. And the veteran said, you are our hero. And President Zelensky said, no, you are our hero. Um, how beautiful and how true of what is happening today and what to me was so moving about that exchange was the recognition of that representative of the greatest generation, the generation that fought the great fight of the 20th century, that the great fight today is being fought in Ukraine by Ukrainians. As President Biden said also at those commemorations, the struggle between freedom and dictatorship is unending. And, Pani Alexandra, I do want you to hear um, that we recognize that in Canada. We recognize that, yes, it is so important for Ukraine and Ukrainians this fight, and so important for you to win it, but we recognize that you're fighting for all of us. That is where the battle lines in Ukraine today are the battle lines between democracy and dictatorship. And that is why we need to support you. Uh, Oleksandra has just spent a few days in Ottawa. And uh, she seems to have spoken to every single MP and senator. Uh, she was... Uh, extremely warmly received in the House of Commons. Et je veux aussi souligner uh, à quel niveau mes collègues, les députés du Québec, les députés francophones, uh, ont accueilli Alexandra et qu'il appuie l'Ukraine. Uh, ils m'ont dit que il comprend en tant que francophone canadienne l'importance de la culture. Uh, et l'importance de défendre la culture. Um, so, Alexandra, thank you very much also um, for spending time with members of parliament from across the country. You made a huge, huge impression. Um, I just want to conclude um, by quoting a poem that I think embodies a lot of what Alexandra was saying, um, at least in the little bit that I caught at the end. And this is one of my favorite Ukrainian poems. Um, it's a poem by Ivan Franko, and it is called Do Velikoho Momento, To the Great Moment. And uh, he wrote, Do Velikoho Momento, Buj Hotove Kozhens Vas. I'm sure there are scholars here, so I'm going to apologize for the rough translation. But translating freely, that means to the great moment, let each one of you be ready. Each one of you can become a Bohtan uh, when the great moment comes upon you. And the Bohtan referred to as Bohtan Khmelnytsky. Most, many people I see nodding heads understand the historical reference. If you don't, you can Google it. 
Um, and I was thinking of it as Alexandra was speaking because she talked about how Luke asked her, why was Ukraine able to resist? And Alexandra said, because Ukraine is a democracy and people see themselves as having a responsibility. And you can hear that in that Franco poem. He says, each one of you be ready. He doesn't say wait for the leader. He says, each one of you can do it. And then he says, each one of you can be the leader when the moment comes. And I feel um, that poem captures so profoundly the democratic response of democratic Ukraine fighting this terrible, terrible invasion. Um, in my canvassing, um, I was out canvassing also yesterday, and I knocked on a door, um, and the door opened, and I heard, Pani Christino. Um, so I knew I was in a Ukrainian house. Um, and this was the home of Marusia. Uh, she's 92 years old. And uh, she said to me exactly what we have heard from Alexandra. She showed me, it was so nice to meet her. Her daughter was there. Um, she showed me pictures. Um, she had her grandchildren in their Vishivanki. Um, but um, Pani Marusia said to me, Ukraine must win and Putin must lose. And Alexandra, so you understand, that's just like a regular Canadian person whose door, kind of surprised to have the finance minister show up at her house at like 6.30 at night on a Thursday, but that's Canadian democracy. And she understood 100%. She was so, so convinced and so certain. So I just want to conclude by saying, you know, Franco was right for Ukraine. He was right for Ukrainians. There is a Veliki moment, and every single Ukrainian, I think, understands that. And I think Ukraine right now is a country of Bukhtans. Um, but it is our Veliki moment. It's our big moment also for every citizen of every democracy in the world. All of us, all of us have to recognize the stakes, all of us have to recognize, and I heard Alexandra say this um, right as I walked in, um, each one of us has to think every day, what can we do to rise to this occasion, to rise to this Veliki moment? So um, it's an honor to be here tonight. Uh, and let me just say, Slava Kanagi, Slava Ukraini. So, thank you so much, Minister Freeland. That was um, a wonderful speech. And thank you, the audience. Um, I'm glad there was no TTC strike. Um, so, uh, you don't get as much credit as you would otherwise. But still, thank you so much, and uh, Slava Ukraine. Oh. <laughs>